Hi everybody, welcome to the July 14th, 2017 edition of Colorado Inside Out. I'm your host Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's get a quick take on Governor John Hickenlooper signing a pledge this week to join the U.S. Climate Alliance of States and Companies willing to meet the environmental standards set in the Paris Climate Agreement. Patty Calhoun from Westward, the signing was gorgeous. They, they did the whole signing uh, uh, ceremony up at Red Rocks and it could not have looked better. But I keep wondering what kind of impact states can make on something that a country isn't deciding to join. What do you think? The, the impact is all symbolic, but Hickenlooper is not a knee-jerk greenie. I mean, he certainly has been favored fracking. He's favored science. He's drunk fracking fluid. So I think in this, in this case, when you look out over how dry the West is, how hot the West is, for him to make, do the symbolic signing was smart. David Kopel from the Independence Institute and DU Law School. The impact of Governor Hickenlooper signing this pledge? Um, well, the pledge itself, not that much, but of course the impact of the, the policies he's put in as, as governor has, has been large. He's got the right idea because I, I think he's right that, that global warming is a serious problem, but he's got the, all of his solutions tend to go towards taking money from working families and giving them giving that money to big business and the shareholders of Excel. As long as wind and solar are on the corporate welfare bandwagon, according to my friends who are in the work with metrics in these industries, these industries will never have the incentives to actually innovate, reduce their costs, and produce reliable and affordable energy. If we want wind and solar, we need to get them off the welfare system. Penfield Tate, attorney with QTech Rock, also a longtime state lawmaker. Uh, what do you make of the commitment from Governor Hickenlooper and also the impact that the many states who have signed the pledge can make? Yeah, I think it is significant on two levels. It, it's significant substantively because whether the, the countries in the Paris Accord or not, implementation was always being done state by state. The federal government wasn't really driving most of this. And, and secondly, what's going to be interesting is I think President Trump may have miscalculated because if too many states do as Colorado and other states have done, it's simply going to show that the federal government is out of state with out of step with the will of the people. But that's where the real change is going to happen. And David's right. We live in the semi-arid West. Water is a precious commodity. We can't make it. And so it's right to be mindful about the impacts of climate change on our ecology in particular. Ben Gilt, public affairs consultant throughout the city of Denver and state of Colorado. Uh, wrap it up for us, the impact that we see from Governor Hickelooper signing this pledge. Well, as everybody said, it's purely symbolic. I think um, as I talk to my friends in the utility world and the oil and gas world, you know, the oil and gas world is largely yawning at all of this action, whether it's from Trump or Hickenlooper or, or Jerry Brown or anybody else. Um, utilities are a much more complicated picture. It really depends on the service area that they have, the regulatory structure that they're working under. Um, but suffice to say, most of this action is not going to really change the trajectory of industry or uh, the environmental picture. Colorado's Democratic primary for governor is slightly less crowded this week following Ed Perlmutter's surprising exit from the race. Considered a strong candidate, Perlmutter stated Tuesday he wasn't sure that he had, quote, the fuel in the tank to campaign statewide and serve in Congress. He also said that he will not run for re-election in the 7th CD since so many others have already stated their intention to run. Patty, this one caught me by surprise, although I was a little cynical a couple weeks ago when we were looking at this grand battle royale in the, the, the Democratic gubernatorial race. We had Jared Polis and Ed Perlmutter and Michael Johnston and Kerry Kennedy, among others. It was just going to be great. Pay-per-view. It never really turns out that way, but Ed Perlmutter dropping out was not the one I probably had my money on. What did you think? Well, last week we were talking about the two clown cars and how crowded they were getting, and now one person has opted out of the Democratic clown car, but already people are angling to also get in. It was surprising, and I think the first surprise, 
probably for Ed Perlmutter was how well Michael Johnston did by getting out front, by raising money fast. But Ed Perlmutter obviously thought he was going to be able to still make an impact and still do well. But his announcement didn't really collect. I think the fuel in the tank he's talking about is not so much energy, but the promise of money. It wasn't coming in. And once Jared Polis gets in the race, Jared Polis can fund himself. So money made a big difference in the Perlmutter campaign. The biggest surprise was not just that he was getting out of the governor's race, but that he is leaving Congress. He's not running again. He's been a good congressman. He could have run in that district for a long time, represented it well. And I think they're going to miss him. David, Patty brings up a good point about uh, not running the seventh CD anymore. We had talked about, even though on paper the seventh CD is very competitive, Perlmutter had uh, attained this status where the, the Republicans were not going to run any really buddy competitive against them, or at least spend a lot of money there. I don't want to besmirch the potential Republican opponents. Now that's done. We have really one of the more significant politicians totally out of the game at this point. Your thoughts? Yes, and, and uh, if Perlmutter is going to step down and wants to be succeeded by a Democrat. 2018 is probably a good year to do it because there, there's typically a backlash against whatever party holds the presidency in the, the first off year election. He first won his first race in Colorado that he won, uh, other than for uh, student body president back at, at, at CU Law School, um, was for the central Jefferson County uh, state Senate seat. That was a seat that had not gone Democrat since the Lyndon Johnson landslide over Barry Goldwater back in, in 1964. And he, he won it and he retained it. And then he, he became Senate Majority Leader and then, of course, went on to win a district that on paper, by voter registration, is very competitive. And in all those races, he ran as a very energetic, fierce, tough candidate. And my guess is he that that's the standard he set for himself. And as he looked at the governor's race, it's one thing to say, okay, I'm going to have a general election that's going to go from, say, August to November and really just have to be working every single second for that several-month period. But now he was, as Patty was saying, it's also it's, it's not just that. Now, now it's going to be, instead of a marathon, it, it's going to be an ultra triathlon uh, of the race for the, the Democratic primary. And maybe said he's, he's, he's just not into, you know, getting up at 6 o'clock every morning and then falling asleep at, at midnight and doing it again and again and again for three, 400 days in a row. Penn, I've considered both Ed Perlmutter and Mike Hoffman two of the hardest working campaigners we've seen in Colorado in a long time. Uh, to see him not have enough fuel in the tank, I take him for it at his word, but do you think there's other factors at play? Well, I think there may well be. I think Patty raises a good point. Um, a number of people were surprised that Michael Johnston raised so much money um, so quickly, and so that may have had an impact. Jared's entry into the race with a candidate who can self-fund puts more pressure on you to raise money. Uh, the real surprise in this whole thing to me was not Ed's dropping out, but the fact that he ran in the first place. Uh, you are right. I think he and Mike Kaufman are probably two of the more aggressive and, and consistent campaigners in the state. I, I think um, Ed's personality was sort of a perfect fit for the congressional seat. He's a real people person. He's outgoing. I, I mean, I've seen him in airports just grabbing people and saying hello, and I've caught him in airports. He really enjoyed that. And, and being a, a congressman is, is more contact with people. Sometimes the governor sits in an office and directs where, which direction state government goes, and that might have driven Ed a little bit crazy. But, 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 you know, the real surprise is that he got in in the first place, and now that he's leaving under these circumstances. But, but one other thing to watch is I'm not convinced the field is set on either side of the aisle. We just had another Republican announce that he was running, um, basically standing for all of the things that Donald Trump stands for. I'm not convinced he's the last R we'll see get in the race, and I'm not convinced that there are no other Democrats who'll get in the race also. Ben, let's talk about the race. What do you think the impact will be now that, uh, perhaps maybe not a front runner, but a significant player in the Democratic primary is now out? Well, I agree, not necessarily a front runner, but um, one of the leaders of the pack, um, one of the most established political, uh, you know, personalities in the state and really the whole region. Um, I agree with Penn that we're going to see other people get in. I uh, respectfully disagree with the other people on the, on the panel talking about Mike Johnston. Uh, 
I don't think there was actually that much surprise about it. Most of that money came from out of state. There's not a lot of belief that he's going to be able to sustain that. Um, I think that the fact that there are Democrats looking to get in really speaks to people underestimating Jared Polis. Um, it happened the first time he ran for Congress, and a lot of people thought that Joan Fitzgerald, another really well-established, very tough, very successful politician who raised a lot of money, got beat pretty badly um, by someone who did not spend one second worrying about money. And I think we're going to see a rehash of that in the Democratic primary. And I think, frankly, Republicans are going to have a hard time competing with that because unless they go on the offensive regarding some of his personality traits or otherwise, they're going to have a very difficult time taking down this highly successful entrepreneur who's just going to be able to continually write checks to himself to the point that it just it's going to be exhausting for the competition. That's a good uh, uh, memory there of Joan Fitzgerald. That was a <coughs> significant race. Good, uh, good idea. Let's get to our next topic. Denver Mayor Michael Hancock delivered his State of the City address this week, revealing his plans to address affordable housing and improve mobility. He also announced the final list of projects to receive funding from the Go Bond Initiative. Denver voters will be asked this fall to approve $937 million of bond funding for projects citywide. David, uh, State of the City address, like any other state of the blank address, are meant for big ideas, uh, not meant for policy discussions. What did you think of what we heard from this and the possibility that, of it becoming reality? Well, I'd say starting off with something he said very early on <coughs> in, in the uh, State of the City uh, was, was inspiring and unifying. He said, what, 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 what makes Denver special? It is, quote, a city built by and for people. So this distinguishes Denver from prairie dog towns, from giant ant colonies. It is not a city for the animals, and they didn't build it. And frankly, it is a, you know, kind of subtle but unmistakable signal to the squirrels that you can stay here, but, oh, not if you cause trouble. This is a city for people, not, not for non-human animals. Um, in terms of the specific policy ideas, uh, he's bragging about this mortgage subsidy for first-time uh, home buyers as a part of affordable housing. I think that's exactly backwards because what we see in the federal mortgage interest deduction, which was also for the purpose of affordable housing, which is a good concept, helping people be able to buy a home, is the economic studies show that all of that economic benefit of that tax subsidy for mortgage interest gets captured by the home sellers. So it ends up just raising the prices and makes homes less affordable rather than more. And I think the same thing will, will happen with this subsidy. Uh, again, the sellers will be the beneficiaries, not the buyers in terms of the higher prices. And then there's the, the talk about the, the National Western Center. Well, in 1990, they got a whole mess of corporate welfare approved by the voters in exchange for a contract that they would be responsible for the maintenance and upkeep and continuing repair of the buildings there. They totally blew it off, and their reward for violating their contract with the city for round one of welfare is they get even more welfare. And supposedly, the, the new welfare is going to help us with food innovation. Well, food innovation happens when people make food that other people want to buy, and that happens normally in, in free exchanges. You do not need Denver taxpayer subsidies going to the ranching industry in order to have food innovation. Penn, try not to feel uncomfortable out of the glowing uh, remarks we have from David on this speech. <laughs> but as you look at the different policy uh, ideas and proposals, some are pretty bold about looking at downtown and the need for, uh, the, uh, the lessening the need for cars. And then also the list of projects on a significant list for uh, a bond that Denver has traditionally been pretty generous with bond measures. So what you're going to put on that list has a really strong possibility of happening. What did you think of what we saw? You know, I thought it was a good speech. It, it was inspirational. It was uplifting. And as you pointed out, state of the whatever are typically uplifting and inspirational speeches. Um, one thing that I think is important, I, I believe when the mayor said that the, the city was built by people and for people, it's important. I, the distinction he's trying to make is one that I've talked about before here, and, and that is the focus of government ought to be taking care of people and supporting people, not worrying about stuff necessarily unless it directly relates to taking care of the citizens. The city is, it, it, it should be for its people, and I think the mayor is saying that. Um, you know, the housing um, efforts, uh, we'll see what happens. I mean, I think it's the right sentiment and it's the right policy issue. 
I fear that you know the, the the cattle may be out of the barn or the horses may be out of the barn and it may be too late because of all of the construction that's taking place that does not necessarily include enough market well I guess you call it affordable housing or whatever at this point um, so that that may not um, be as effective uh, the mobility push has me a little bit concerned only because I think the city may be a little bit ahead of RTD uh, Denver is not a place where our transit system is as robust as places like DC New York Philadelphia Boston even Chicago um, we don't have a really good rail system and the bus system is challenging and so when you start limiting options in terms of using vehicles uh, you may be cutting off your nose to spite your face because it's really tough to get around Denver without a vehicle. Ben does do significant changes if you're going to change mobility around Denver if you're going to make significant changes in this downtown core does it take something like this from a mayor to set that policy forward so that others maybe like RTD or other entities can follow? It does take that in theory. Uh, I don't think we're getting that today in practice. I think that when you evaluate the actual policy that they're proposing, starting with affordable housing, they're going to continue to have an impact fee, which is laughable. Uh, they are only going to do a half a mil, again, totally insignificant. Um, the development community has basically pleaded with the administration to go for a full mill or a mill and a half to drop the impact fee and to actually generate some real revenue for this issue. Um, I think when you start to look at transportation and development and all the rest of this stuff as, as it grows, um, Penn is right. There are a ton of cranes around town. I was at a bar the other night and counted 12 just from my seat. Um, the, the reality is, is that Denver over time has not made a decision to invest in the concomitant infrastructure to support all the growth that we've had. So we just keep packing people into these buildings and saying we'll figure out parking and we'll figure out transit. Uh, Penn also talked about a bunch of other cities and their transit. Those are all much larger markets than Denver and I don't think they're really good comparisons. But when you look at a market like Pittsburgh or Portland that are much more uh, closely aligned with the population of Denver, you can see that it's very possible. It's just a conscious choice. So what I'd say is that once again this administration is hitting all the right notes in terms of what they talk about and how they how they try to present themselves, but there is nothing behind it. Uh, it's, it's not a pretty state of affairs. Patty, you've had a front row seat to see how downtown Lodo, all of it has developed over the last 20, 30 years. Are these ideas that we're hearing from Mayor Hancock the right way to go about its future? Well, they're certainly familiar sounding, but the most shocking thing he said was that he was frankly shocked by how much Denver has grown, how quickly it's grown, how big the boom has been. And I have to ask, where has he been for the last few years? He's been in City Hall, and before that, he was the president of the City Council. We know that we saw this growth was happening. It wasn't a surprise when the first crane came and the second crane came. And we could have had city policies instituted earlier that would have helped put a break on some of this growth, or certainly growth without thinking about transportation, without thinking about parking, without thinking about all those problems. It was interesting that he moved his, state, um, his city speech from the airport, where it was next, last year, you know, a big, big project, to a neighborhood talking about the people who matter. But I still think those people could be very irritated come November when it comes time to vote for this bond. On the seventh anniversary of Marvin Booker's death, his family is asking the Denver District Attorney, Beth McCann, to reopen the investigation. Booker died at the downtown Denver detention facility in 2010 while under the custody of the Sheriff's Department. Meanwhile, as the number of violent incidents are on the rise at the jail, another individual was killed this week following a fight with another inmate. Penn, none of this stuff is easy to tackle, and it's been, we, we've seen a new administration take over, a new sheriff, so I think we've seen some progress, but do incidents like this point to more work to be done? Oh, absolutely. This is a systemic failure within city government that we've talked about through administrations. Uh, when you talk about the Booker case, remember this is the homeless street preacher who died because five sheriffs were on him, quote unquote, detaining him while he was in the facility. Then he got tased and ended up dead. And the reason his family's asking to have this investigation reopened is 
there is a question whether the taser that was submitted and examined was actually the one used on him. And the belief is that they were intentionally switched because had the correct taser been, been looked at, it would have shown that whoever operated it used it for far longer than they should have under the circumstances. You know, the tough thing government has is when you lose the credibility and support of the community, it, you've got no place to go. And that's part of what's been happening with law enforcement here for a while. Even though we have body cams, even though we have an independent monitor, we have seen so many of these lawsuits and so many settlements around circumstances and events that never should have happened. And so my hope is that the DA reopens to at least investigate whether the allegation of swapped out tasers is correct because you've got to rebuild some credibility with the community and that helps law enforcement also. Um, but you've got to rebuild that credibility with the community or, or you just have no hope. Ben, Beth McCann talked pretty tough on the campaign trail last year about being willing to prosecute cases. It was a big issue in the campaign. When she looks at this case, do you see a reopening in the future? Well, as Penn said, I, I think the issue at hand is a pretty serious one. Um, the notion of uh, covering up or falsifying evidence is a pretty serious allegation. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I, I think Beth should reopen it, particularly if, if uh, there's, there's reasonable evidence that suggests that that is what happened. And I think, um, frankly, it's another example of where the mayor and the administration continues to sort of try and wave their hand over here so that you don't look at the problems over here because they have continually swung and missed at trying to, trying to deal with these issues effectively. Patty, from what we've seen so far, do you think it's likely that DA McCann will open this, reopen this case? I am guessing she won't because the evidence is always that those cases aren't reopened or people aren't charged. But it's interesting to remember that Denver voted to build this new Justice Center and one of the reasons was for more safety because the old facility out at Smith Road wasn't supposed to be so safe. So almost seven years to the day of Marvin Booker's death, another inmate was killed by an inmate on Sunday night or Monday at the Denver jail. No charges are going to be pressed, supposedly it was a mutual fight, but still that if that's going on, something is not go going right at the jail. David, wrap it up for us. The, there are data saying that there are more violent incidents reported now at the Denver jail than in the past. I don't think that's because there actually are more violent incidents. I think it's actually that Sheriff Feynman is leading the, the deputies to be more responsible about reporting all possible incidents, and, and that is a constructive step forward. Well, let's get to our favorite part of the show, Disgrace of the Week. As always, Ms. Cahoon, please start us off. Well, as an editor, I can say that proofreading counts. And unfortunately, <laughs> at the legislature, they did not proofread that final bill that went through that did help fund rural hospitals, worked out the hospital provider fee um, com compromise, but unfortunately neglected to charge the right amount of tax to collect them for the SCFD and also RTD. And RTD is standing maybe to lose $3 million before there can be a fix. A lot of the SC, SCFD money is not going to be going to some of the agencies that need it. So get a proofreader. Hire an editor to read it next time. <laughs> Indeed. David. Ni the most sophisticated Nigerian email scammers deliberately put errors into their initial solicitations because they don't want to, they want to only deal with that one percent of the population that is sort of so willfully gullible that they'll ignore obvious warning signs. Well, in the email that ensnared Donald Trump Jr. into the meeting with the Russian lawyer, part of it said the Russian lawyer was a crown prosecutor. Now, in Russia, they had a revolution a century ago that got rid of the monarchy, so they don't have crown prosecutors, and they haven't had for a long time. That should have been a warning to a prudent person that this was a scam. And for more coverage of 1917, you can check out the uh, Time Machine episode of Colorado Inside Out just a couple of weeks ago. It's online right now. Penn, your disgrace of the week. Or Donald Trump Jr. and the campaign were so driven to break the law to win that they just didn't care about obvious warning signs. Ben. I'm going to say Cory Gardner for his faux tour of Colorado and talking to people. He published a newsletter that explained that he had traveled all over the state over the weekend and met with people here and met with people there and met with people everywhere. But the photos didn't include any groups larger than like five. So I think for a U.S. senator, that's a pretty disappointing number. 
Say something nice about somebody, Patty? I will say, um, despite what I just said about Hancock, the city of Denver booming looks pretty great. Last night, the Big Eat, which is independent restaurateurs put it on, was a great example of this town's restaurant scene. And we have an international group, Slow Food Nations, which is in town this weekend. Lots of free events over at Union Station and Lamar Square. Get out, enjoy it, and enjoy how good the city looks. David. The people of Venezuela who don't have food because the socialists destroyed their economy, who are continuing to go out in the streets and protest to get rid of the communist dictatorship there, even while the secret police run by the Cubans continue to murder them and, and imprison them. Penn. I have two real quickly. The Black Arts Festival for number one, staying in the community at City Park. It was a great event last week, and congratulations for doing that. And secondly, I'm going to toot the horn of Denver Water, a board I've served on for 12 years for finally getting the um, record of decisions for, for the approval to expand Gross Reservoir. Um, it is important to the management of a scarce resource in this state, and it's something that all Coloradans ought to be proud about. Ben. I'm going to say good job to Kyle Zeppelin and the Ditch the Ditch crowd for filing the latest lawsuit against the terribly misguided I-70 project. Uh, so kudos to them. That is all the time we have tonight. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to check out our new season of Street Level looking at the city of Glenwood Springs. It's every Tuesday this month and a little bit into August. Every Tuesday at 7 p.m. It's part of a great lineup every Tuesday with a variety of travel shows and some great comedies, both the IT crowd and Arab Labor. If you have not checked that out, it's also available online at cpt12.org. A great uh, uh, show that we've been very proud of to be able to get produced out of Israel. Really tells a, a funny tale and family that really can, you can uh, appreciate from really any culture. But it's great to be able to offer it to all of our viewers. As always, be sure to check out our podcast on iTunes and for our CIO post game segment on Twitter and Facebook. For everyone here at Channel 12, I'm Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you very much for watching. Good night. Thank you.